Welcome everyone to this AMS Automotive Evolution live stream where we're talking about startup manufacturing. I'm Christopher Ludwig, Editor-in-Chief here at AMS. My pleasure to welcome you and to talk about this fascinating topic with some really expert guests um, um, together where we'll have a chance to get some questions from you as well. As many of you know, uh, the automotive world has of course seen many startups come onto the scene over the past five to 10 years, many with grand plans, some with lots of funding and investment behind them. Not all of them have seen it through to production. Some have left and come back, um, and, and, and others were, of course, still tracking closely. Um, it's an exciting space, uh, but as we know, automotive production has very high barriers to entry. We're talking extremely high capital costs, very complex supply chains, manufacturing processes. Um, it's not something that, that often can happen very quickly. We all know about the uh, production hell, uh, as Elon Musk put it, you know, that Tesla went through for many years. Uh, but there's also very, very high rewards if we get it right. At the same time, the rise of uh, electrification and the EV is in some ways turning, as the title of our live stream suggests, uh, is turning all OEMs into kind of startups and not just OEMs tier ones, uh, having to adapt and get ready, new players coming in across the supply chain from battery manufacturers and traditional players too, like big steel manufacturers are also, as we'll hear, having to turn uh, into much more dynamic companies, both to serve these startup customers, but also change their processes um, you know, in line with the, what the market is requiring. And that's a lot of what we're gonna talk about today with what I, what, what I think will be an extremely engaging and interesting interesting live stream so just a couple of, of highlights for, for the topics we're gonna you know that we, we see in AMS uh, when we talk about startup manufacturing uh, it's really in many cases about getting vehicles into production quickly what can we do to shorten those long development uh, times keep up with quickening uh, development cycles and, and sort of overcome if you like barriers to 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 start not something that's easy, easy to say but hard to do raises lots of questions around make versus buy strategies. Uh, when it comes to a plant, do you go greenfield? Do you convert brownfield? Do you opt to contract manufacturer? And of course, with that, uh, a host of different partnerships, changing roles of suppliers, um, perhaps at the design and development engineering stage, um, when it comes to designing automation um, and process flows, and, 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 and right through to the actual execution of production itself. We as AMS certainly see a lot more room for co-creation. We see it happening across the sector, and, and that's something we'll, we'll likely be talking more about with our guests today too. Something all OEMs are, are, are looking to do more as well is uh, you know, achieve higher standardization, especially when you're talking about the low scale that of course, by its very nature, a startup begins with, uh, and in the EV space, many many traditional OEMs face as well. You have low scale, so you want to base that on standard platforms, uh, simplification of, of components, uh, ways to to be able to to to, to simplify and, and reduce the costs of manufacturing. If you're a startup, you have some advantages, perhaps, when it comes to legacy systems in which you don't you're not carrying around. So, an opportunity to go digital first. To, to maybe start fresh, uh, design your processes from start, but of course, at the same time, that comes with investment, that's its own complication. Uh, and, and the OE, uh, traditional OEMs um, perhaps have some advantages from using their existing infrastructure. But nonetheless, we see a lot of agility, we have lots of opportunities for digitalization and automation in new places. Um, so that's, that's something where, you know, those are kind of a high level uh, talking points that we're keen to start with. Um, uh, before we get into it, uh, I have to thank uh, today's sponsor, ArcelorMittal, uh, who, who has uh, sponsored this live stream and uh, one of our partners here at AMS and has a lot of interesting topics and information to share with you. You can get links to, to the company's steel solutions uh, on our website uh, and we'll be sharing some more information with you during this live stream as well. A little flash ahead to who's going to be joining us on air today. Uh, we'll shortly be joined by Shell uh, Valin, who's the co-founder and chief manufacturing and logistics officer for Volta Trucks, a very exciting startup uh, that we're going to introduce you to and go into some detail together with Shell quite shortly. 
and, and Jesse Pagel, who is the Automotive Steel Solution Director at OsloMetal, a brand new role for him, a new area for OsloMetal. Again, we'll talk about a lot to do with speeding up processes and transformation uh, in relation to, to both startups and traditional automotive manufacturers. So um, a really interesting uh, set here. And you know, I'm, uh, with that, I'm, I'm gonna uh, introduce our first guest, uh, which is Shell from Volta the Trucks. So Shell has more than a 20 year career in automotive. He started uh, at Ford in manufacturing, numerous locations in Europe and North America. Uh, later came on to to, to join to join Volvo, uh, where where he worked across uh, head of as head of assembly in in factories in various manufacturing roles, and eventually went on to really help to to launch Volvo's manufacturing in China after the Geely acquisition. We're talking something like three plants in in three years. So there you're already at a sense of the startup pace that um, that he's had to adapt to. Latterly uh, played a very key role in launching manufacturing for the Polestar brand, of course, Volvo's uh, luxury electric vehicle brand, which is now making very interesting headway in the world. And then since 2019, joined Volta Trucks. And it's with that I want to bring Shell on um, so that Shell, you can tell us a bit more about Volta. Shell, it's so, so great to, to be able to welcome you to this AMS Automotive live stream. Thanks. Yeah. I'll just because uh, just to make sure that uh, you know what Volta Trucks is. Um, so you can see the, the uh, product there in the, in the first picture. Um, it is an electric truck. Um, it is, it's different. I think we wanted to make something that is uniquely designed from scratch for, uh, for electrification to for uh, city distribution in principle. It's a 16 ton truck. Uh, I think maybe we can go through the slides and then uh, we will see more what we're talking about. So on this page, I took the uh, key characteristics of the vehicle. Um, I think one of the key things that we've been uh, doing with this is that the uh, um, electric drive axles were just coming on the market for our size of a vehicle. So we were able to put on an electric uh, drive axle at the rear freeing up the space between the uh, ladder frame and uh, then enabling putting the battery in there. This gave us the chance to both to, to free up a lot of space and above all, we could design the, uh, the driver's cabin to be a much lower position and uh, adapted to city distribution. I think it's quite key to be sitting low in the city. You don't want uh, the driver to sit high uh, and lose contact with what's going on on the ground. Uh, these are heavy vehicles and they are they're moving around in, in uh, mixed traffic many places with, with the bikes and the pedestrians. And I think it's very, very important that the driver sits on a lower level and have, and have the eye contact with the, with the surroundings. Um, in addition, obviously we wanted to focus on safety and with, with the, um, uh, with a lower position, as you can see in this picture, the more you can see, the safer they'll be. I think that goes very well. You can see many examples how this guy on the left will barely see the uh, top of the head of that uh, woman in front, whereas on our side, uh, it is very, very clear. And I think you're much more part of the uh, of the traffic in that way. So that's, that's one of our key selling points. Not only lower, but also sitting in the center. So it gives you a better uh, feeling of uh, the uh, moving, uh, you know, other uh, in in the traffic around you. Uh, so these are the uh, focuses uh, focus areas for the company. Sustainability, obviously, is an electric vehicle. Safety, as I mentioned, but also shortage of drivers is a very important driver in the industry uh, right now. Uh, it's difficult to to hire and retain drivers. So I think uh, companies see a big value in in having trucks that are desired by the drivers even. Uh, for, the, for that, I think also the ergonomic benefits of sitting low, which means that you just have a small step and then you slide into the driver's seat instead of climbing up and down 20 times a day. And, and also the whole uh, cabin is, is designed in a way to, to really please the drivers. Um, other, otherwise, yes, we want to scale operations quickly, come to market quickly, etc. Uh, 
and simplification is one of the key uh, items uh, in, in, in the, our product offering, and particularly in, in our offering with the truck as a service, where we uh, you know, enable anybody to, to get on to electrification without having to uh, you know, arrange a lot of financing. Obviously, I think we all know that electric vehicles are more expensive to start with, but much less expensive to drive. So it's a good solution to, to uh, get a, uh, a, a fixed fee per month. Uh, and in addition to just, just the, the cost of all the other things, to enable uh, everybody to, to switch uh, f uh, quickly to electrification. Uh, so uh, our task solution includes charging, uh, IT service, all maintenance, uh, etc. So um, yeah, that, that's the, in short the, uh, an additional offering that we have in, in addition to the uh, actual vehicle. Um, as you said, we started in 2019. Um, I was working in Polestar and uh, uh, Carl Magnus Norden, who had the idea, came to me and asked, why is so much happening in electrification for cars and so little with trucks? And we couldn't really find a good answer for that. So we said that probably means that we should do it. Uh, the company, this industry needs, uh, uh, you know, what could, could do with, with people who, who drive the change. Um, so we, we started in 2019, we built a um, demonstrator that we launched uh, a year later. And uh, with that, we could raise funding to start hiring our engineers. In 2021, I would say, we started really developing the technical uh, concept and, and the, the, the drivetrain and all the technical solutions. And uh, so, as you can see, that means it's, uh, we are now in, just now, uh, we celebrated today, in fact, um, the first vehicle coming off the line in our production plant in Steyr, Austria. We have a contract manufacturing here and, and uh, we signed that contract one year ago. In that year, we have developed the processes and, and uh, there you go, this is the plant. This is where I'm sitting now, by the way. Um, we have, uh, in that one year, we, we um, designed, the, developed the processes, acquired and installed the equipment. Uh, well, we developed the IT systems because the MAN who abandoned the plant took that with them. Um, and uh, and uh, the quality systems and trained operators and today we have the first vehicle rolling up the line. Uh, so we're quite quite uh, you know proud of that. This is part of the pre-series that we are building right now before the full production starts early next year. We're building 43 uh, production ready vehicles uh, in this series. Uh, this is just uh, I mean the layout of the plant is not so important, but uh, those small pictures on the side gives you a bit of a feeling for how the vehicle is designed. It's uh, in many ways, not only from the outside, but also from the construction, uh, a little bit more similar to a bus than a truck, in, in that it doesn't have stamped metal. Sorry, uh, uh, <laughs> Arcelor. <laughs> but it's, it's more in, um, uh, it's, a, it's a space frame, which we then uh, cover with uh, composites. And um, so with the, the plant has, has paint off, so this is a mild steel, so we, uh, we uh, electrocoat it. Uh, and, and uh, have in fact some, some uh, painting in some places as well to, to, to double insure against corrosion. Then there's a, a, a plant for the, the cab assembly and, a, uh, and then this is switched over to the general assembly or the, the chassis assembly. Uh, one more thing on this slide is that we are also um, building and supplying the truck with, a, with the cargo box, which is another area where I think um, we can develop something new in the industry that uh, typically today the operators will buy a chassis cab from the truck manufacturer and they will have to go out themselves, have a project team, a big project to, to design and build uh, and get acquire uh, a box to be built, which increases the lead time and, and uh, I think in many cases also the cost. So this is the, our trucks come with a cargo box on uh, specified like the customer wants. I think that's uh, a quick summary. If you have any uh, further questions, please, uh, you're welcome to ask. Thank you, Shell. So, and, and just a quick note for our audience, those slides uh, are actually available to you as a handout to download right away. So if you go to the control panel uh, right here in the platform, 
uh, where it says handouts, you'll find um, those slides right there, some great information and illustration of the, of the factory, and obviously some information there about Volta. So, so there, Shell, uh, thanks so much for, for giving us that, that kickoff. I think it encapsulates very well the, the, the journey and the, and, the, and the progress, and obviously the, the speed to market that you're working to uh, in manufacturing. We're gonna pick up some of those points to more detail in the Q&A. Um, I just wanted to ask a quick quick follow-up as, as part of that kickoff, as you mentioned, you know, you. You obviously worked, as I mentioned, you worked for Volvo and helped launch Polestar as well. Now you're launching in the uh, commercial vehicle space and the electric vehicle space, uh, which obviously has some some key differences from a from a from compared to passenger car. What, what would you say? So, what are some of the really strategic differences that you've noted already in terms of ramping up production on the commercial vehicle space uh, versus what you did in the in the passenger vehicle side with Polestar and Volvo? Oh, I I think I find it it's difficult for me to speak on uh, commercial vehicles uh, in general. I know that we are different from uh, from anything any of us in the company have experienced. Um, we decided very early that that speed to market is is extremely important because this is a we are in an early mover and that is an advantage that has a lot of value. Um, so so uh, what we did was that we have you know, built in taking risks, I think I, I could call it, not in risks in terms of a risking a quality or safety, but in terms of, um, well, you know, car de vehicle development is, is typically a sequential process. You, you develop something, you build it, you test it, you evaluate it, and then you do the next step. We did uh, these different, instead of having them sequential, we, we, we overlapped meaning that we start building the start the next phase before we have the results of the first phase so that is uh, i mean you learn a lot by doing it but you don't know for sure if you have got all the results before you start the next phase so i think that's key to the development for the manufacturing side um obviously to us uh, starting up our own plant was out of the question because of the time pressure so uh, contract manufacturing was the only only way to to do this in this short time um, that doesn't mean that this is something we will continue forever, but, but uh, certainly that was very key to enable this super quick uh, coming to market. Excellent. So, so that, that kicks us off in, in a great way, and, and we've already got some questions coming in, which we're going we're, we're gonna, to we're gonna bring into the, into the discussion. And, and just again, as a note to anyone who joined late, those slides are available uh, as in the handout section. Um, but I want to, to bring into this discussion as well, actually, just before I do, actually, uh, a really quick quick note to you all. I think it's something I just wanted to highlight because because Shell, who's joined us today for this dynamic live stream, um, will also join us later in the year in person at our uh, Munich conference, the Automotive Evolution Europe event, where we're bringing together the uh, automotive manufacturing community in Europe to talk exactly about electrifying at top speed, exactly about ramping up EV and battery production flexibly uh, uh, and, and, and resiliently. Um, so a lot to talk about there. Shell, Shell will join us uh, in Munich, uh, and I hope many of you uh, will consider joining us as well, hopefully in person if you're able to. Um, uh, there is an online option too. Uh, we're good at putting a link through for you to, to register and check out more about that event and some of the great speakers and content that we have coming there. Uh, so sorry to interrupt this message with a short note, but uh, um, you know, I think it's an exciting point and uh, we look forward to having Shell join us there. But what I'd like to do now is bring our next guest, our next expert as well, into the discussion because the perspective is really important. Jesse, who's, uh, who's just signed on. Jesse, great to see you. Uh, Jesse's been working in automotive uh, mining uh, space since 97. He, he did joined Oslo, Oslo Mittal in 2005, has worked across uh, many areas of the business, including playing a key role in, uh, in the development of uh, Oslo's advanced high strength steel uh, in, in the South American region. Had a break, uh, worked for some other places as well, I believe some OEMs and tier ones, uh, and recently came back in 2019. And Jesse, I, I understand that you, you know, the role that you're in right now um, is, is, is quite new and is really taking, uh, taking on a, a, a strategic side of, of implement, implementing steel solutions faster with your customers and in the company. So just to kick us off there, um, from that, I take it that you share Shell's 
uh, objective of reducing time to market in manufacturing. Um, can you tell us a little bit about a little bit more about your objectives and the role that you have in terms of uh, in terms of you know Arcelor and, and your customers? Yeah, thank you, Chris. Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, in fact, uh, it's exactly what was mentioned before. Uh, one of the key factors that we are facing today in the market, it's really uh, uh, to, to how to speed up uh, these uh, new steel grades that we will see in the market in the coming years. And uh, the, the important point to, 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 to have this is exactly the creation of this new organization inside uh, ArcelorMittal, which we call it the Automotive Steel Solution Department. It's, um, it's uh, really the main objective is to have this uh, answer to the, to the OEMs uh, while they are dealing with uh, electrification in this, uh, in, in this field we need to accelerate as much as possible the availability of new steel grades. And I hope in the future, Volta Trucks can, can use also some, some of the innovative steel grades and solutions that we are doing today, exactly focus uh, on uh, this new concept of design. Because in fact, the design of the, the, the car, vehicles, trucks, and so on, as mentioned also before, uh, uh, the, the design is changing. So we need to somehow to address this, not only in terms of steel grades, but uh, uh, showing the benefits of key uh, uh, design, key applications. So the focus is to link the steel grade to the final application to support these changes in the automotive industry. And I think, and I think that's key because it's, it's therefore your role is not necessarily to to sell more and more steel, <laughs> it's it's about the design and and the function within that, and so and so therefore the innovations that that can come speeded to market are are, are an important uh, side to that too. Um, I, before we go into a bit more on it, um, Jesse, I mean, as I alluded to up front, um, clearly as as a, as a large steel producer, um, a traditional company in its own right, you know, is it how do you see the changes within Arcelor to to, to keep up, if you like, to, to change its own processes, perhaps to make address some of these issues in its own uh, production inside too. Is that is those lessons that you're applying internally as well? Yeah, in fact, um, in fact, it's exactly uh, what we understood and what we are putting in place. Um, we are much more nowadays uh, uh, um, linking the steel grades with the designs. And uh, we are trying to understand the benefits that we can bring uh, uh, to, the, to the OEMs. And by doing this, uh, what we understood is that we need to work in partnerships uh, uh, with different uh, companies like uh, engineering uh, um, uh, companies and so on to uh, uh, go inside the body shop uh, so uh, 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 to understand the benefits that we can bring by applying this kind of technologies that we are going to talk today, like the multi-part integration concept, where we are trying to include as much as possible uh, different uh, 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 steel parts in just one to simplify the life inside the body shop for the different OEMs. Yeah, and, and that, that's a point, you know, and you, you obviously talk a lot about the engineering and design side and how important of, that is on the focus um, uh, to, to simplify and, and, and speed up these, these sort of processes. What are, what are some of the, you mentioned the multi-part integration, perhaps that's the area. What, what would you point to as a really important focus within this space um, to, to really quicken that in engineering and implementation when it comes to batteries, body structures, and, 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 and vehicles as we're pointing out here? Uh, it's um, in fact it's understanding that uh, what is happening today in the market is that um, the design is is again I, I probably I, I will repeat myself once again but the design is changing the way of uh, producing car is changing uh, uh, and trucks by the way uh, and uh, for for this uh, point of view. Uh, what we are trying to give uh, to the OEMs is really a kind of a modular solution that can be applied 
uh, uh, for the different powertrains that um, that we have today. Today we're talking about electrification with Volta trucks, of course. But if you go to the car makers, uh, uh, the conventional car makers that we have in the market today, they are dealing with different powertrains inside the body shop, plug hybrid uh, uh, vehicles, hybrid uh, electrical vehicles. And we still have a, a large amount of ICEs in the, in the, in the field uh, and under production. And what we are trying to do with this multi-part integration is trying to simplify and find modular way just to, to apply depending on the powertrain that we are talking talking about. The, the final idea, uh, uh, and to be extremely uh, uh, clear and transparent, is try to find a way to assemble uh, with few parts a complete car. So we can save space inside the body shops, we can save time uh, uh, to, uh, uh, to achieve this um, speed that is uh, requested nowadays uh, nowadays uh, by the by the automotive industry fantastic and those are those again we we're gonna we're, we'll talk a bit more about that not least uh, as well with shell considering where he's where he's he's at and congratulations again shell on the news today of today being if you like you know the first the first coming off the the, the line first going to production in terms of these prototypes and and, and pre-series or pre-series i should say as opposed to, to prototype um just um you know one of the yeah. one of the maybe just uh, to to say we we are actually uh, um, we are we're in the process of, of finalizing the uh, the first so I think the uh, official uh, car will come coming off next in in the next weeks. So, okay. But anyway, yeah. Okay. So sorry, the start of yeah. really producing yeah. that that first. So oh, we're celebrating the start. Yeah, that's that's what I mean. Anyway, we're celebrating. I think that's the key. <laughs> <laughs> The plant is going, is, is coming to life, and I'm sure that's very exciting things happening behind you there. Um, you know, just just so maybe a last point on, on this startup aspect in this in this CV space. You showed already that Series A, B, C, and the, the C funding, which you have this year. Um, you know, is it really important for that funding that you can show that real life progress? You know, that 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 behind you now is is beginning of production. Um, you know, we know in the startup space there's there's often promise. Um, reality must must come in at some point is that has that been particularly important for you and perhaps also in the commercial vehicle space well i think it is important for everybody uh but it, but right now it's extremely important because there's been so much media about uh, startups not succeeding in, in manufacturing i'm not sure whether it's all manufacturing i think uh, it shows up in manufacturing it could well be engineering or quality or something else that that can uh, show ends up in manufacturing, uh, but uh, we have been very focused on manufacturing from the start. We we uh, are not going to do that mistake at least that we uh, we have uh, a manufacturing setup that doesn't work. So uh, we we have put a lot of effort into it, and and uh, the finance uh, industry have noticed and they have appreciated very much what we've done. We have been keeping to our timeline all the way, and uh, I think this is being noticed and uh, very much appreciated. Uh, I think we all know, uh, I mean, I think it started with uh, Elon Musk talking about manufacturing hell, and uh, we've seen that echoing around the uh, various corners of the world. And uh, I think uh, I keep talking about manufacturing heaven in my company. <laughs> I trace a bit of the smiles here and there, but, but uh, certainly, uh, that's how we look at it. It is this is something we can do, and and we have uh, so far proven that we were right. Well, if, if manufacturing heaven is anywhere, it's in the green rolling hills of Steyr, Austria. So so I'm glad you could you, we could be there in a way with you today. Um, speaking now of Steyr and and of the plant, um, you made the choice obviously to work with a contract manufacturer with a partner. Um. And as I mentioned, outline. I mean, clearly you could go in other ways. Um, tell us a little bit about why that was the right strategic choice for for Volta. Yeah, I think, as I mentioned in the start, um, doing our own plant was out of the question to start with. So that that's a given. Um, also, um, we uh, in the end, when the Steyr plant came on the market, 
it was very easy to 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 decide because it is super uh, good plant. Uh, I mean, this in this plant they've been manufacturing trucks for more than 100 years, and uh, and uh, the last 30 for MAN. So uh, when they decided to scale down the number of plants, and this came on the market uh, with a private investor who wanted to start a contract manufacturing, the, that decision was very easy. So so yeah, no. Um, I think the the point is that yes, you can obviously recruit people. You can build a some sort of a manufacturing facility quickly, but it's it's not quite the same as coming into a contract manufacturer where this, the, everything is already there. They they have a common way of working, etc. If you bring people together, they typically have worked in different different companies with different system, etc. And and you end up having to tell everybody exactly what to do. Here is more the other way around. They will tell us when we have got to ask him for something. <laughs> so, and that, that, yeah, that's an interesting. That's a great point. And and we know there's other models out there that, that other startups are are pursuing, and, and and those are of great interest too. But I think it makes a lot of sense why you went this way. Can you just tell us a little bit more about how that partnership works in terms of um, the development of manufacturing? You just told us how you know they they push back and say this is the way you should do it. Maybe when, when, when your designers or engineers have another ambition, um, do you co-engineer the manufacturing? Um, do you co-design it or do you kind of hand over? Maybe just a little bit of snapshot of how that, how that works. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Now we, we decided to, to uh, uh, buy the process development from, the, from uh, Shire, which makes sense because they work, they know the equipment. The, uh, much of the uh, production is on existing lines. Like the, the chassis assembly is all, the, the cap assembly is already there. So we will be producing on a mixed line together with MAN because MAN are still here for another uh, nine months. Um, so we will be starting up together with them before they, uh, they phase out. Uh, so what we do, we, we, uh, we are doing the product engineering, so to speak, uh, also from, from, uh, from the manufacturing engineering point of view. Which is more like uh, you know the the manufacturability etc. But then uh, working together with the Steyr team to to develop the processes and they actually buy the equipment for us and they install it because they uh, I think that that's a wise way of doing it so they can't blame it on us if equipment uh, doesn't work or uh, isn't giving the the, uh, the capacity as as requested. So I think there's a uh, we found a, a good balance. How to to get the best knowledge out of them, but also uh, make sure that we agree with with what they're doing, and uh, we we have found a good cooperation uh, that that serves us uh, both well. Excellent. So Jesse, when we, when we were talking about earlier, is perhaps even a step further before in terms of the co-engineering and development of 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 the. For example, the body in white uh, and, and the structure. So is that, you know, I mean, that's a, I think that makes sense as an ambition. Are you starting to see that partnership and transformation and that aspect of the value chain really start to to happen now? Uh, you 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 brought the, uh, on the table something that uh, we really believe that we need to do to 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 have these uh, new concept of steel uh, solutions that we uh, started. Uh, uh, end of 2020, it's brand new also as well, this kind of solutions, the multi-part integration concept. And one of the key factors that we have today, uh, and I, I, I fully agree with what was mentioned, is partnership. Partnership is a key factor to speed up uh, uh, the process and to have these, uh, these uh, parts ready to the market. Not only for the engineering point of view, and this is one point, we have uh, partners to, 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 to design also, we have some internal expertise regarding design, but we are moving further on until uh, uh, the body shop itself. And manufacturing these parts is again, one of the points that we need to, to answer to the market. Uh, when I'm talking about multi-part integration, for example, and this is uh, 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 just came to my mind, I, I, I need to understand inside not only uh, the, the stamping facility that I need to stamp these big components, but also how to manufacture it. 
uh, how to, 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 to assemble together all these parts. There is a, 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 a design, there is a manufacturing uh, uh, collaboration with different uh, societies today to bring these answers uh, to the market. It means that I cannot only uh, arrive to the market with a steel grade, a nice steel grade with high strengths to reduce weight and so on. I need to understand and support the, the OEMs in a way they are going to assemble all of it. So this is a kind of a game changer that we have inside our solar metal today uh, and a common understanding inside, inside our company that we need to, 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 to go further on and in this uh, direction to understand, to re really understand uh, uh, how to assemble these kind of components. I'm not talking about the standard ones, as we know in the market today, like a B-pillar or the cabin of the truck with, uh, with a structural uh, individual parts. What we're trying to do is to put all these parts together in just one. And we need to understand how to assemble it inside the OEMs. And this is something that we realize and is something that can support uh, uh, the OEMs, startups in this, uh, in this, uh, in this matter. Uh, when we are talking about speeding up, I need to arrive with answers, clear answers, how I can assemble this new concept of steel uh, uh, components. Because steel is a steel, uh, keep a, a, a interesting uh, solution uh, in terms of CO2 emissions, in terms of uh, 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 recyclability of, uh, of uh, the, the, uh, the components and, and so on. And what is uh, interesting, for example, when we are talking about these steel grades and, and the new concept of these big parts that you can see in the, the uh, PDF that uh, the audience can, can download, is that uh, 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 these big panels need to be assembled inside the OEM and we need to understand the complete supply chain until uh, the body shop to bring these answers and to, to have the possibility to, to reduce the time to the market for the OEMs. Yep. Absolutely. It's a really uh, important points. And, and, and Shell, I'm just interested from, from your point of view and either your experiences, obviously, in the um, in post of all before or indeed now, um, you know, that, is that an approach you're also looking at in terms of those standardization of those parts and modularization um, to help in that ramp up here too? Yeah, maybe first I'd like to say that I, I forgot to mention the, um, the supplier's role in, in the, the speed to market. Obviously, it's not enough that the engineers work fast and, and manufacturers work fast. I think the often the most critical part is getting the part there on time. Uh, and a very uh, crucial uh, role in, in the whole speeding up the, the, the system. Um, obviously, it's not that easy when you're a startup because I think uh, some, some companies have their eyes on startups and want to do business with startups, but many of the, the bigger companies are uh, are uh, I, would, uh, I don't know if it's reluctant is, is the right word, but but uh, we have a, we are we having a small volume. We are uh, maybe considered risky because startups are risky in a way. You don't know if they will be existing in a few years, and the, the company may put on a lot of effort, and then the, and the, the uh, customer disappears. So um, I think this supply chain and suppliers role. In, in a startup speeding up the, the process is, is extremely important. And luckily, there are a number of companies out there who are actually adapting to this, are open for speeding up and, and delivering products much quicker. The agility is, is also out there, but uh, it's something that, that uh, obviously needs to, to continue. Um, in terms of partnerships, yes, that, that's certainly a key word for our success as well. Um, we uh, we decided quite early that there are certain areas where we will be uh, developing our own stuff, and they like the concept and integration of it. But as much as possible, we would like to take parts off the shelf, so to speak, uh, that are available, or at least have a very short uh, lead time for development of, of uh, modifications. 
so, so partnerships with, with companies uh, is certainly key to us as well. Um, so, yeah. Um, now to your question uh, regarding standardization. We, uh, we have, I say, what, what, we, what we're doing is that we have focused, as I mentioned, all on getting to market quickly, not so much as developing a world-class platform that can be used by any vehicle in the future. I think that is what we are used to from uh, our previous companies like Volvo. Uh, developing a new platform takes years and years because all the things you need to think about and how will you fit with that model and that model and that model. So we decided uh, the opposite. Let's go for something that works. Now, now we are developing the next uh, platform, next uh, models, uh, more thoughts are being put into conversation, of course. Uh, that, is, that is always always good. Certainly, uh, we would like to use the same type of batteries and the same type of uh, powertrains. But also, I think we, we hope to, well, I mean, we are we, we, uh, we're experiencing a lot of uh, good feedback on our uh, current design. And uh, uh, I think it's a, it's a good selling point. However, I don't think that will be enough in the future. Uh, for all time, so obviously we are, you know, preparing for for a new interesting technology to be brought into the next vehicles. And again, uh, we will be looking at can we do this so we can transfer it into the first vehicle. In any case, that it is uh, uh, transferable over uh, a platform of families. And if I may add, um, we are uh, very optimistic on the demand of our vehicle uh, in any market. So we don't uh, think that we will be, stay a European manufacturing site. We, uh, we assume that within short, we will have a global print footprint. And uh, for that, certainly communication is, is crucial uh, that we can have a common bit of process and, and uh, uh, supply structure that, that works. So I think Seeing the big picture, even though we are uh, focusing on one plant right now, we're already developing the plant for the future and, and the structure for the future with, with uh, you know, uh, commonization as, as key uh, key uh, keyword. So having a, a commonized standard platform will, will be really important as you move into other plants and, and, and geographies, be that in your own facilities or again with other partners and stuff. So. So clearly, clearly in a overlapping there too with what you're clearly talking about there, Jesse. Um, just you know, it's interesting when we think about um, simplification and looking at the platform. Of course, a big hot topic has been giga stamping, giga giga casting, which uh, which Tesla, of course, uh, uh, you know, talks big about, and Volvo, you know, made some big announcements earlier this year. Jesse, I'm just interested in in in, in hearing your take on on an approach like this. Does it I mean, obviously, there's an aluminium aspect to that, so maybe you have your own view from this. But just, just interesting because our audience has been very interested in, on, on, on how that how that is developing. Uh, I, I would like just to come back one point uh, yeah. regarding uh, common uh, and modular uh, availability in the world. When we started this multi-part integration concept, one of the first things that we uh, looked at was exactly the possibility and the availability all around the world. So this kind of uh, multi-part integration concept is uh, uh, today uh, uh, we can produce whatever uh, you are uh, in uh, in uh, in the world, in USA, in China, in Europe, of course, uh, South America. We are working uh, uh, locally to 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 improve the, the the facilities over there to make it possible to have common and a global uh, modular uh, uh, components. And uh, it's uh, directly linked to, to what. Um, uh, 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 you you mentioned about the uh, 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 high pressure digesting uh, solutions that um, Volvo announced this year. We have uh, the famous one uh, uh, from uh, from uh, the company in US, uh, uh, Tesla. But in fact, if you look the concepts of it, it's exactly the same philosophy that we are trying to do with still when we are talking about multi-part integration concepts. Just to give you an example, if you if you look the 
uh, age frame, the year age frame of a, of a vehicle. Uh, our solution today uh, is, um, is, um, is available in the market. We go from the design until the prototype. In, we did it in uh, less than two years from the design to the prototype. So it's also answering uh, this uh, timing that we need to be ready to supply uh, and to answer this uh, time frame that's completely new. Before it was not, but today it is. So high pressure die casting aluminum, if you look at the concept and it was claimed by, by, by OEMs uh, saying that uh, I am coming from, uh, I don't know, uh, 20, uh, 50 parts into just one part. It's exactly the same concept that we are trying to do with the multi-part integration concept. The here age framing is still today. We come from, uh, if I remember well, 13 uh, different company, uh, components in just one company, component, just one company. So the strategy that we are applying in our concept uh, multi-part integration to, 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 uh, to the market is exactly in the same way, in the same way. We are trying to commonize and to simplify and to integrate as much as possible in just one component. And a global view, a global availability is mandatory nowadays. There is no way to have just, oh, okay, I'm going to have just in Europe uh, this technology, but uh, all around uh, uh, it's not available. It, 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 we, uh, as I mentioned before, we started from the beginning, understanding our facilities all around and how we can have exactly the same solution in the different markets. So if Volta Trucks is going to China and want to use this kind of concept in their design, they can use it. We are able to produce over there uh, and, um, and um, we are able to supply uh, and to answer these, um, these uh, questions. But of course, from my perspective, I'm, I am a steel maker, uh, uh, but, when you look at the high pressure die casting concept for the age frame, the, 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 the rear part of the vehicle, uh, it's exactly the same. We can do it in steel. Uh, uh, and uh, with the benefit that you don't need to change uh, the concept inside the body shop, it still is well known uh, uh, in terms of. Uh, of uh, assembly operations, uh, spot weldings, uh, and 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 um, and um, uh, how to assemble uh, different steel grades and so on. So uh, somehow we are in the same philosophy, with the benefits again uh, uh, that we can apply with uh, with um, with um, with steel, uh, the same philosophy. Thank you, Jesse. And, and so important there around the, the, the opportunities in multi-part integration for steel. As Jesse mentioned, um, the audience, uh, we have available some inf more information on that in the handout section, where I also directed you to, to, to download Shell's slides on Volta. Just go to the handout section of your control panel here in the platform, and the slides are right there. So feel free to take those, and there's more information. And of course, you can talk to Jesse and, and ArcelorMittal if you're more interested on, on that side too. Um, a couple of questions from audience have been have been coming in, and, and they are aligned with some of the things that we're, we're keen to we are talking about. So, for example, uh, on on the material mix, we had a, an audience member who was actually was afraid he might have missed it early on too, uh, Shell, because he said, uh, uh, "Did Volta say anything about material in the chassis?" And indeed, I believe you did. Do you want to talk a little bit about the material mix that you're using and 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 what the approach is there? Yeah, the, the chassis is the more of a standard uh, type of chassis. This steel, uh, um, uh, yeah, steel frame, a ladder frame of steel, uh, very similar to what everybody's using. Uh, I think maybe a little bit more, um, as I said, bust light in, in the cabin where we have this space frame uh, with, with composite cladding. We have a composite roof and, and a side skirt. Um, Having said that, um, as I said in the beginning, we uh, we didn't want to start a big research or R and D program over several years for this first vehicle. We took uh, you know solutions that we know work and and uh, implement them. Uh, but as I also said, we uh, do realize and acknowledge the need to to keep in the front, and um, 
we are certainly looking into uh, other materials for coming platforms. Uh, so uh, die cast aluminum casting sounds very interesting for sure. Uh, but yeah, so we, we have a lot of people, of, uh, engineers employed from the UK coming out of uh, sports vehicle uh, manufacturing and design and uh, they are uh, very keen on, on the various composites, etc. So we are, we are exploring this. Uh, we, we hope and believe that we will bring out some world first uh, big bangs uh, when we launch our next vehicle in uh, 2025 or thereabouts. Excellent. Well, Jesse, we'll make sure as well that your, your engineers have the understanding of the multi-part integration opportunities for steel as well as the, the high-pressure die-cast aluminium. Um, yeah, another question actually, um, Shell, um, got a number asking about the, the battery uh, for, for, for the truck, uh, both in terms of, of, of where, where, where it's located and also your, your approach, your approach to the battery modules pack um, in-house or or with partners i do believe there's been some announcements as well about partnering with there so maybe you can tell us a little bit more about the, the battery approach yeah i think uh, in fact we've seen a few startups uh, deciding to, to make their own batteries directly from start we decided not to and i think uh, many of the investors have it praised us for that because uh, biting over too much can always be a problem uh, we decided to go out and look for somebody who could provide batteries that we could use directly off the shelf. And we were quite happy when we uh, teamed up with Proterra from the US uh, that can, that can, uh, that have been making batteries for their own bus manufacturing for many years. They have experience and also uh, they have developed their own uh, technology quite a bit. So it, it's very competitive. Uh, these are, uh, we use, uh, there are like long uh, rectangular batteries, uh, two meters long approximately, and uh, they are, we have three on top of each other, two or three, uh, depending on the range you want. Uh, so the, the, the longest range, we have about uh, 200 kilometers now uh, with the three, three uh, batteries set. Um, so, and these fit exactly inside the ladder frame, which is a very nice solution in many ways. Uh, partly because it is already protected by the ladder frame, so you don't need to build a big, heavy uh, protection around the batteries. But also, it's very good for for balance and stability of the the driving feel of the vehicle. And uh, yeah, I mean, this is enabled by us use having uh, got available uh, an e axle from Meritor. We we also sourcing in the US. Um, the uh, which means that we can take out the, the drive shaft that normally goes where the battery is. I think this is some of the benefits for us that we are designing the vehicle from scratch compared to many of the incumbents who, who more or less just uh, replace the uh, the engine with a with a with a uh, power, electric powertrain with and keeping the uh, drive shaft etc. Mm. So so I think yeah. So the other thing there because it's a. EV first and, 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 and the platform accommodates that, so you're not having to, to accommodate, accommodate both. Um, Jesse, obviously that, we talked about that earlier. I mean, one of the aspects for dealing with many of your customers is to, is to have uh, solutions that accommodate multiple powertrains because, because you know, the brands are, are still have those, those legacies and will still for, for some years. Um, in terms of solutions around batteries and battery housings, uh, are you also strongly looking at, at different aspects for things like multi part integration or, or other standardization to to help um, support this? Yeah, indeed. Uh, this is um, in, uh, coming back to my, my new home, my new responsibilities is part of, uh, of, uh, of the, the team that we have in uh, working with me, uh, battery itself in two ways. There is uh, one way that um, uh, I will uh, 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 say it's um, uh, uh, the traditional one when we are talking cell to pack and you have the standard battery that we apply uh, in, um, in, in, a, in a vehicle. This is one point. But, but 
that the, there is a change, and I, I like it a lot what was mentioned. Uh, uh, when you have the frame and we put the battery, so avoiding to have a, a structural battery pack because the frame is going to take care in, uh, uh, of the battery anyway. And the, the philosophy that we are doing today is exactly in this direction, exactly in this direction. So we have a, a specific X uh, in our, in our uh, uh, organization inside the steel solution uh, dedicated to the battery pack or the battery vehicle itself in general, where the, the, the hawker, for example, or the frame is going to take care uh, uh, of the battery integrity uh, uh, in the near future. So this is an uh, is important uh, a point that we are also addressing. So it's a, a these steel solutions. Just to be a, a, a clear and to share with the team here, is that uh, not only uh, for body and white, but we have a specific uh, a group working on the battery itself, uh, for cell to pack, cell to to, to body, and also uh, for the chassis component. What we understand today and we have this in mind, is that in the near future for the, the, electri uh, the electrical uh, uh, mobility, everything is going to be linked together somehow. So um, the chassis uh, design is going to change because so we have a different concept of, uh, of, uh, of uh, the powertrain. Uh, uh, we have the batteries, but we need to integrate the batteries inside the body and wife. In the case of the truck, we have this frame, and, and this is something that we are addressing also as well. So somehow in the near future, we are going to have all these linked together. And this is one of, uh, one of the targets that we have inside the, the steel solution uh, group uh, here. Excellent. We have a, a question from the audience, which I'm going to leave to either of you if you want to take it. It's uh, hot stamping versus uh, generation three. Where does gen three stand with respect to production readiness today? Uh, Jesse, that's something you want to you want to tackle? I, I, I can I can comment it. I can comment it. Uh, and um, uh, let's let's uh, come back from 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 the beginning when uh, I spoke about the multi-part integration concept. Uh, most of the parts uh, when we started this uh, development was based on um, hot stamping material. So the, the PHS um, until 2000 megapascal, uh, exactly due to the fact that uh, we have complex geometry and we need to stamp uh, these parts, these big panels. And what we look at that, uh, was a, a, a existing way uh, to produce this. But multi-part integration is not just for PH, uh, PHS uh, uh, group of material inside uh, our portfolio. The third generation is also something that we are working with. Uh, but for the moment, for the moment, we have some uh, uh, concepts that I cannot share today because we are working uh, on it. It will be ready uh, soon. And I, I hope that I can share very soon uh, with uh, everybody. So uh, we have a, a, a huge percentage in the multi-part integration concept uh, with, um, with hot stamping material, for sure. But uh, in other hand, there is, um, there is some concepts that uh, we are working with code stamping material and so on. So the third generation is coming. Uh, how much is going to be comparing to the hot stamping uh, solutions that we have? Difficult to say today, difficult to say, but there is a place and we are even looking for, uh, just to, 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 to use a teaser here, uh, uh, the possibility of tubular structures uh, uh, with uh, this kind of uh, of uh, generation of advanced high strength, but just as a teaser. <laughs> so you, yeah, just to, to whet the appetite of uh, of our audience there. Okay, excellent. I know we're running coming up in the hour, so uh, we're, we're running close to time. But I think if, whilst I have you here, maybe I just steal a little bit more time because um, so we just have a, a few more questions here. But what, one area I did want to touch on. Um, Again, we talk at AMS uh, increasingly with experts on factory twin, digital twin, uh, and I'm wondering, um, maybe starting with, with you, Shell, was 
is that been an approach to help with the factory planning and implementation together with, with Steyr or, or with your teams? Or is, or is that something maybe that comes for, say, future rollout um, as, as factory twin played a, played a role? Yeah, well, I think we, in terms of uh, factory digitalization, we we uh, take what is here. Uh, we, uh, but we are uh, certainly looking already now at what the future will bring, and we assume that we will be building our own plants in the future. So we are uh, having a, a small team looking at the strategy for the, the factory of the future. Uh, so uh, I think it is a um, it, it's something we we are just starting, but uh, but it, there's always uh, some some uh, you know trade-offs because it's a low volume production. You need to have flexibility, etc. So, so um, I, I'm not overly excited in, in over digitalization uh, where not needed. I think in many areas it's super important, like training and guiding operators in the work, uh, like uh, in the engineering and the process development. Obviously, we do virtual builds, uh, so we can uh, see before we do anything that that the, the parts fit, the tooling fit. And we we do optimization of the whole design. So so certainly those are things we 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 also do as as we have been doing at Volvo and Ford etc. But I think the um, I'm I'm cautious in in uh, taking off on a you know, developing technology for the technology's sake, uh, since some of our competitors are doing that. And uh, I think we I would. Uh, my personal uh, preference is to to do rather too little than too much. Very, very, I think practical, but but a, a position that I'm sure resonates with with many, and especially as you said, you know, at that, at the plant with the idea of time to market and using what was there and ready to to go. Uh, Jesse, what about from Oslo's point of view in terms of you know? Maybe that multiple integration or other ways that you're working with your with your customers. Uh, are you are you doing more virtualization, digital twin side, uh, or are you also looking at other kinds of technologies too? Maybe not. Hopefully not for just for the technology's sake, but areas that can hopefully or really would uh, speed up your your time to implementation. Digitalization is uh, something that we are working with, uh, not directly inside ArcelorMittal. That's the reason I spoke before about partnerships. So the idea, I, I cannot build, uh, I, am not, I am a steel maker, I am not a, 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 a car maker. So uh, I need to use these uh, tools uh, in order to, to, to show and to demonstrate uh, uh, how good we can be uh, by using the different concepts that we are promoting today. So we have partners uh, working with us. I can give some numbers. Uh, some of them are well known in the market, like Bertrand Engineering, for example. They are working with us in this matter exactly to demonstrate how, uh, uh, in a digital way, how we can bring the benefit for, for the OEM. Uh, as I mentioned before, as, as much as I can, I go to the prototype phase and I, 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 I use real parts because, you know, sometimes you need to touch the part and to see the part, uh, 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 a real part to understand that it's feasible. So we pass through this, um, this um, digital uh, uh, study, but we, we are focusing on having also real uh, parts at the end. Uh, but I, I need to. I don't have a. I don't have choice. And, and this is something that we also decided from the beginning that I need to 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 have this um, understanding of uh, of the body shops uh, uh, and digital uh, uh, evaluation is mandatory for me. I, I yeah. I need to. It makes perfect sense. I realize we're pretty much running out of time there, and as usual, I I think we. We're going to leave our audience wanting more, and that's not such a bad thing because um, I'm going to tell them to join us in Munich and and talk more with us directly there, and and also to keep up with our live stream. But but just a final point I want to kind of raise, give a chance to comment on because I, I do think it's an important one. And Shell, your experience in, in 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 markets like China where things went so fast in in the time that we did, and now you're doing this. Obviously, you found a way to do it fast, as we've learned 
you know, in, in an existing plan. You're talking about other global expansion. Um, but are there kind of specific lessons and, and ways of working from the experience in China that you're looking to bring to Europe, for example, maybe other markets? Not, not everything, clearly. Is, is, is that a key point um, as you take that experience forward? And I'm, then I'm interested, Jesse, your, your point of view that as a, a to given given your global global perspective. Well, I'm not sure if I can generalize too much, but uh, in China, things do go quickly. Um, they are, uh, sometimes you ask, I have to ask myself, uh, how come uh, everything is possible in China and uh, nowhere else? And and yeah, so many, some of it could be because you have a, uh, from the top, they make decisions. They don't sit in committees and uh, try to uh, win, win uh, votes uh, with whatever is decisions. They make a strategy together with the experts and they uh, implement it, even though that may mean that uh, a few millions have to move away because they're making an EV uh, cluster in, in some place. Um, those things wouldn't happen in Europe. Um, but, but I think that that's the extreme. I think even on a, on a micro level, they are uh, uh, yeah, they are hungry. They're, they're making decisions and and uh, go for it. I think this is uh, a lot of this mentality can certainly be uh, replicated or is, is already in Europe, but it's it's uh, I think more of a management uh, uh, question than anything. Operators are typically uh, very flexible and eager to make the changes, but it's uh, up to management and and uh, you know making decisions without having all the facts. Do we have enough facts to make the decision? Yes, let's, let's take a decision. Uh, sometimes you just sit there, do we have all the facts? No, we don't know, so let's gather more information. So that, uh, that is uh, very much the key. Uh, knowing the value of time, time to market, time to decision is so important. Uh, you, you, you have to take more, more uh, risk in that sense, but it, it's, uh, I think it's something that pays off if you, uh, in the long run. And we, I'm sure we have, we have taken some decisions that we, we uh, maybe would have done differently, but, but still, the fact that we have uh, taken decisions quickly and moved along has brought us where we are, and, and it pays off. It's an important point, I think, for, for, for any startup, and but also as, as kind of the point of the, of the program today, uh, you know, any OEMs looking to, to act agilely uh, in an agile way, and then coming to those decisions based on where you can and using the China lessons for that. Jesse, any final any final thoughts on that? Yeah, China. China. It, it's uh, it's good that you ask it about it, because in fact, uh, uh, the first uh, real uh, uh, part to be uh, uh, applied in a vehicle, uh, if you look the multi-part integration concept, uh, will come from China. Uh, seems uh, I, I, just to to give you an idea, we started this project end of 2020 uh, uh, in in general. And uh, the first uh, real part uh, was uh, presented this year in China for a real vehicle. So they, they move very fast, uh, as uh, was mentioned. So, uh, and, uh, but a, a strange point, or a strange, a good point, I would say, something happen, is happening in Europe also as well, somehow. Uh, and uh, uh, the speed, uh, for implementation of this kind of concept inside traditional OEMs also as well, just to, not to give names here, because I am not allowed to do, it's, it's uh, fantastic. So I am talking uh, before we, when we talked about um, uh, new uh, uh, solutions and so on and new designs, it took uh, five years, six years from the starting point until the SOP of the vehicle. China did it with this uh, multi-part concept in two years and a half. And uh, in, in, in Europe, I, I am, what I am seeing today is something in between, it's not too fast like in China, not two and a half years, but uh, more uh, in between three to four years or something like this. Something is going to change very quickly in Europe also as well. And um, I am foreseeing uh, uh, applications like these in the market already in 2024 and 25 in the real vehicles in the, in, in the, in the, uh, with, uh, with some uh, or 
almost all OEMs are interested in the multi-part integration concept to be extremely clear today. So we have some, uh, some uh, important and specific real uh, uh, um, work with different uh, 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 vehicles that is going, are going to be launched uh, during 2024-25. So things are moving fast also in Europe. So we are somehow uh, we are taking advantage of the experience in China, and I, I agree. I agree. It was not to just replicate uh, uh, what is happening over there, but uh, trying to find a, a balance, a good balance to 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 use this uh, this interesting uh, uh, speed uh, when we are talking to, to to new applications that they have in China. And, and I think that is a great point at which to to, to draw a line here in terms of the, the, the positive momentum we're starting to see in Europe. Shell and Volta are a great example, also taking experience and, and some lessons, but but applying them in new ways here and beginning uh, what I'm sure is going to be an exciting journey here in Europe and indeed, as we've learned today, uh, eventually beyond too. Um, Thank you so much, Shell. Thank you so much, Jesse, for, for taking uh, even more time than, than I asked you originally to, to share some insights. Um, but, but it's been very fascinating. We've had more questions come through that we're, that we're able to answer, but we'll, we'll put some of those questions to our panelists anyway uh, afterwards. And again, you know, don't forget, we have other opportunities uh, later in the year in Munich. And before, but before then as well, um, we also have uh, our live stream series continues and next month on October 6th we have uh, another session on sustainability and manufacturing building the green machine we're calling it uh, of course um, this is you know speaking of Europe not, not just a nice to have when we talk about the energy crisis and, and, and costs of, of, of living and issues that we have there you can imagine the importance of building more renewable energy and finding ways of efficiency and energy reduction and emission reduction and waste reduction in manufacturing. So that's our topic for next month. There's a link that's just come through. Register and join us there. We look forward to uh, to talking to you then. And um, yeah, again, as mentioned, we, uh, we've got more to come in, in Munich uh, at the end of the year. Just a few more of the speakers who will join Shell. There's more besides this, but we're in for BMW, uh, CATL, ZF, Ital Vault, obviously Volta, there's, there's more coming as well from the likes of Audi and, and Toyota too. So you won't want to miss it. We've got an exciting program there, talk, picking up on these sorts of topics and more. Um, another link will be there with you to register um, um, there. So we hope to see many of you later in the year in Munich. Uh, many thanks again to, to our sponsor, ArcelorMittal, uh, and, and, and a reminder about those, uh, those slides which are available for you. Uh, and if you want any more information, please let us know. We're happy to connect you. Um, yeah, and, and keep up on the Automotive manuf Manufacturing Solutions website for our live streams, for our coverage, our ongoing coverage of the automotive manufacturing space. Um, news coming out every day, lots of features. Our next digital edition will be coming to you soon, uh, just in a week or two, just in two weeks or so. So, so get, you know, look out for that. Lots more exciting content uh, along the way. That's it for us here at, at, at AMS. Uh, thanks again to our, our great panel. Thanks again to our audience. Uh, this session will be available on demand in the next day or so. So if you missed anything and you want to pick it up, that'll be available. But I want to thank our, our panelists again and look forward to talking to you all again very soon. Thank you for the invitation. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.